Hey guys, I want to say thanks to all of you for supporting the channel. We've passed 25k subscribers and yeah, I know I'm a bit late with this. Today's a very special episode. I'd like to thank all my guests for being here. So a warm welcome to Jane Nightmares, The Darkest Hour, Derek Weber's Scary Stories, Booze and Booze, Bad Vibes, Campfire Tales, Possessed Radio, and Danny Dreadful. Enjoy the stories, guys. This happened in 2007, when I was 19. I was attending college in a very safe southern town with a population of about 30,000. I was lucky enough to have a modest place to myself because my family owned property in a suburban area that they no longer used. The house was very small, but it sat in the middle of a two-acre fenced-in lot with a lot of pine trees and shrubbery. So, Saturday night some friends picked me up and we went to a few parties, hung out at their house, nothing major. They dropped me back off at my house at around 1am. I had two dogs that usually sleep in my room, but this night they were being restless, so I put them in the living room and closed my bedroom door so they couldn't keep bothering me. I immediately fell asleep. A few hours later I woke up and I saw a man climbing in my bedroom window through the shades. My bed was pushed completely up against the wall by the window, so by the time I saw him, he had already had a knife at my throat and his hand over my mouth. I don't think I intentionally left this window unlocked, but I'm a 5'11 girl and it was almost out of my reach from the ground. It was also incredibly narrow, like maybe one and a half foot high and three foot across. It never came across my mind that someone would break in through that window. My first feeling was absolute rage. I remember that more than anything. I could instantly tell I had no idea who he was. His cheeks were really hollowed out, and he was very thin. He was also older than me, maybe in his thirties. He said, If you don't scream, I won't kill you. His voice was so calm. I remember later thinking that his tone was so normal, we could have been discussing the fucking weather. He took his hand off of my mouth that was now bleeding from his fingernails. I told him I had money I could give him. He could have my car. I just started rambling on about any possessions I could think of, and he said, That's not what I'm here for. To cut the conversation short, this lunatic held me down for probably five minutes, just talking to me. I asked him things like how he knew I was there. He said it was a lucky guess. By then, my dog started freaking out in the living room, and he seemed to get a little unnerved. He became more serious started groping me and told me to lay down. When he let me go for just a second, I was able to push him off and dive head first out of my window. When I fell, I landed on a metal lawn chair that he drug up from my yard. I was only sleeping in my underwear when this happened, so in addition to the scrapes on my mouth, my whole body got pretty bruised and scuffed up from the fall. I immediately got up and ran as fast as I could to my neighbor's house, who happened to be a state trooper. Time has never been slower than it was when I was standing outside, banging on his front door. When he answered the door, I told him what happened. He grabbed a bulletproof vest, a gun, and ran towards my house. His wife called 911, gave me some clothes, and helped me clean up a bit. Running had taken a layer of skin off the bottom of my feet, and I had left bloody footprints on their carpet. They never found out who it was. My friends that dropped me off said they saw a man with red hair walking down my road. It was too dark in my room for me to know what his hair color was. I could tell that he was left-handed by the way he held the knife. The police were beyond unhelpful. They only told me that he had had to have been watching me for a while to know that I lived there alone and what room was mine. A couple of years later, a man was arrested for a previously unsolved sexual assault and murder in 2005 of a girl a few miles from my place. He was never charged with anything relating to the murder in 2005, but DNA was able to place him. He lived in her building. He had red hair and was left-handed. Lock your windows and trust your dog.
I'm an only child. It was about 6 in the morning on a Sunday, and I was in my living room watching cartoons with both my parents asleep when I hear a knock at the door. It was a pretty woman in her 30s, holding a large cardboard box, but I'd never seen her before. There was a big white van pulled up in the street in front of my house, with a man in the driver's seat. She told me the box is for my parents, and asked if they were home. I told her yes, but they're asleep. She said, Oh, that's okay. I can come back later. But that she has something for me too, and it's in the car. She asks if I could come out and help her get it out. I'm lucky because I just started kindergarten, and we just had the stranger danger talk just a couple of days before. I said to her, Maybe later, when my parents are awake. Goodbye. And I shut the door. Immediately I told my parents and they didn't believe me. A couple of years later, I told them the exact same story and they realized I did not make it up. To this day, they have no idea who that woman could possibly be based on my description. My dad had a meth addiction at the time and hung out with a lot of questionable people. So I wonder if word spread around that he had a daughter or that maybe someone had just happened to notice by watching the house. I'll never know, but they never came back. June. My partner Johnny comes upstairs and finds it cute that I'm checking him out on OkCupid. Okay I'm confused as I haven't logged in lately, like in months. How could I have been looking at his account? I log in and check it out. There's a list of seven or so people that have been checked out from my account today. Johnny's included, and also someone I work with. Well, that's embarrassing. Nope, wasn't me. Time to change my password. The next day at work, I was sure to bring it up and laugh about the fact that my OkCupid okay account was hacked to the person who was in my viewed list. I didn't want this person thinking I actually looked at his account. We work too closely together, and I already get the impression that he may see me as more than his boss. It always pleased him that his luggage tags printed his middle name and first initial as Chris, comma, T, dot. This is not the type of person who should see his name written out like he's God's gift to Earth. I'll refer to him as Chris. Chris just laughed off the OK Cupid hacking comment I made. I found it strange that he had no questions or comments on the subject. Most people would at least ask if you changed your password, but nothing from Chris. I brushed off the situation. A few days later, I was out of the office for work. Johnny messages me saying it happened again, that I checked him out on OkCupid. No, I didn't, but I changed my password again. July. It's a weekend. I'm having a lazy morning in bed with Johnny. I get a Facebook notification. Your account has been logged into from a new location. The IP address points to Chris's hometown. My heart's racing. What the fuck is going on? I take care of the Facebook password and I screenshot the notification. Later that night, I get a text from Chris. Happy fourth boss, LOL. I assume he's drunk and worried about being caught having his access to my Facebook removed so quickly. No. It can't be him doing this. It's just coincidence, right? Johnny is convinced it's Chris. But that means someone I work with on a very small team is targeting me. This will make work nearly impossible. I can't talk to anyone at work about this. I'll have no way to run my department. The situation will get minimized. Chris drank a lot. I'd seen it at work events and when we traveled, just the two of us. He often got out of hand, but everyone brushed it off. He's young. It was funny. We've all had those nights, but as long as you show up for work the next day, it's fine. 
I brought it up to him once. Hey, Chris, you need to be more cautious about how much you drink at work events. He didn't speak to me for three days. I offended him. I told him that he's not allowed to have fun at work events, is what he told me when he finally snapped at me. I recoiled. He's three times my size and we're in a secluded space at work. One time while traveling, just the two of us, I got very sick. I told him I couldn't make it out for dinner, so Chris offered to pick up something from the nearby store. He knocked on my room door and handed me the water he got me. He tried to make small talk as I thanked him and indicated I was going to go lay down. It was apparent by his stance in my hotel room doorway he wanted to come in. He moved an inch closer, and I said goodnight, shut my door, and locked every lock I could. It wasn't the only time he made me feel uncomfortable. I hadn't noticed any other accounts being hacked for a while. I was cautious around Chris, even disassociated when I could. I avoided work outings if he was going, and I would back out of lunch plans that he decided to go to once he knew I was going. But we often had to work very closely. We were a team after all. I couldn't do my job without him and him without me. November. Johnny was online checking out his FetLife account one evening. He saw I was also online via the old messenger they used to have. Johnny asks me if I'm logged in. I'm not. Again, my heart's racing. It's different this time, though. The violations are beginning to feel commonplace, normal, expected. But this hacking is extreme. No one outside of my FetLife friends knows about this account. Definitely no one I work with. And there's some faceless nude photos of me there. I reached out to FetLife. They gave me the IP address of the last login. It's the same as the Facebook hack. Shit. I can't avoid this anymore. I can't pretend it's just coincidences anymore. But I need proof it's Chris. All I have is an IP address and intuition. I can't take that to HR. The police, maybe? Will they help, or will it make matters worse if they need to contact my employer? I start looking into the login history of any account that tracks it. My bank account. Why is there an iPhone logging into it daily? I don't have an iPhone. But Chris does. Shit. This is real. This is happening. I don't know what to do. I'll call the bank while at work and ask them about the unknown login. Chris is at his desk, right next to mine. The conversation is easily overheard. I hang up with the bank. They can't help. Chris didn't say a thing. Under normal conditions, a coworker would inquire. Wow, is everything okay? Did you change your password? Did any money go missing? Nothing from him, though. So out of character. He's always interested in my personal life. The next weekend, I wake up to a phone call. The caller is calling from my phone number. My heart skips a beat, but I answer. No one responds. I just hear breathing. That's it. I've had it. I'm losing my sanity. I spent weeks, months, researching IP addresses and how I might be able to use the only info I have. I've lost sleep. I can't focus at work. Johnny is worried about me and my safety. I am too. But what can I do? Johnny suggests we go to the police. I don't want to, but I'm at a dead end. I agree. The officer is kinder and more receptive to my situation than I expected. This serves as a reminder to me that this is a big deal. I shouldn't minimize it in my own thoughts. She takes the report, every detail, and will use the IP to subpoena the ISP. 
Weeks go by. The officer on my case claims there's no crime. The ISP records were never obtained. December. My work email keeps doing this strange thing. Messages I've read keep being marked as unread. Weird. Is it him or is it just the multiple devices I use to check it on? I don't know. I can't tell. The server doesn't keep a login history. That I can see. Should I talk to IT? I know them well. They will help. But that would make the situation real and known at work. No, not yet. I can't bring myself to do it. I can't do this anymore. My heart is constantly racing. The slightest noise sends me into a panic. I get a security camera from my front door and worry a bit less when I hear the door slam from the wind or when the dogs bark at something they hear. I'm becoming comfortable living in fear as much as it's impacting my health. At least I have the pepper spray Johnny got me. I carry it whenever I'm outside. Chris and I have a shared account that we use for work. Maybe I can get an IP address from that. If it matches, that's some proof, right? Dead ends. What if I send him an IP tracker? I've learned you can place an invisible pixel in an email. It will send you the IP address of where it was read. All I have of Chris's is his work email and a Gmail. I test both, on myself first, of course. I can't take the risk of him figuring out that I'm on to him. Damn it, our work email blocks it, and Gmail reroutes to their headquarters. Another dead end. More hours, days, weeks pass. I've called private investigators. They're impressed I've tried the tactics that they already have at their disposal. I feel confident that I'm doing all I can, but more lost that the professionals can't help. February. One last attempt. It's a week before I have a seven-day out-of-the-country trip with Chris. It's with a large group this time, but I'll still be working very close, too close, with him. I send Chris an email with a shortened link that will track what IP address it was clicked from. I've tested this. It seems to work, but I'm shaking. What if this tips him off? What if he knows I'm on to him and he attacks me at work? What do I send him to get him to click? I find a local event that this particular breed of neckbeard would be interested in. Hey, Chris, saw this and thought you'd be interested. Five minutes later, Chris replies. Hear panic? No. Excitement, maybe. A mixture of both sets in. I don't care what the reply says. I check the IP tracker. It got a hit. I'm shaking. I can barely type or hold my phone. It's the same IP address as the Facebook and FetLife hack. I got it. I have the proof I need. It's Chris who's been stalking me via my accounts. My intuition was right. As much as I didn't want it to be confirmed as him, it is. That's a relief. A weight's been removed. But then it sets back in. What do I do now? Go to HR. Back to the police. We've got that trip coming up. I need my team there to do the job. I'll wait until after I'm back. It's not that bad. I'm used to living like this now. Johnny thinks I'm insane for considering it. He's right. I am. I've lost touch with reality. The situation has made me unable to determine what levels of uncomfortable one can and should live with. A night of debate, and I've made my decision. I won't wait. I'll do it now. I text my boss, Jay, the next day, asking him to meet me for lunch on Sunday. I need to talk to you away from the office. This is not a normal request. We're close at work, but this is bizarre to him. He tells me I'm scaring him. I wish I could tell him, don't worry. The following day we meet for lunch. 
I'm so nervous I could vomit. This is it. This makes this all real now. I tell him everything. I'm worried he may minimize the issue. Chris is just a kid. He didn't mean anything. I'll talk to him tomorrow. But after I finish speaking, Jay is at a loss for words. We have a plan in place to take this to HR tomorrow, and he's already helping me find someone to replace Chris on the work trip. Again, I'm relieved and nervous at the same time. Shit is going down tomorrow. Seven months of living in fear, and finally, I can see an end. Monday. My pepper spray is in my pocket. I picked out a work outfit that would conceal it today. Jay calls me, asks me a question. I don't remember what, but I take it as an invitation to go to his office. Anything to get away from the person I now know, without a doubt, has been hacking and stalking me. Jay wasn't expecting me, but understood. The department head is in his office. Jay is about to inform him of my situation. Having my story told by a third party was surreal. I filled in the details where needed and gave them the folder of evidence I had collected to take to HR. Screenshots, IP addresses, written accounts of the timeline up to this point, the emails from Chris confirming his involvement, and the info from the IP tracker. The day is a haze. I was at HR's office at least twice. I saw the police drive through the campus and had to fight my way with the HR director. He didn't feel I had enough evidence to prove the email I sent to Chris's Gmail was actually the Chris that worked here. I dug through my work email and bam, he emailed my work email from his Gmail account once. Enough evidence for our non-believer. Hours go by. It's almost 3 p.m. What the fuck is going on? If I keep leaving my desk, Chris will know something's up. I can't call HR and ask. He'll hear the conversation. Chris walks over to me. Oh shit, he says. He's shoving his work phone in my face. Too close for comfort. He got an invite to go to HR for 4 p.m. I'm screaming inside. No one else is around. If he's gonna do something to me, now is the time. That notice is the forewarning of being fired. That's how they do it at my job. I manage to look concerned and I tell him, I'll let you know if I get one, insinuating maybe our team is being let go, not just you. He walks away, no idea where to. I sit at my desk, shaking in fear. I don't know when he will return. How could HR betray me like this? They know the situation. Damn it. They should have warned me that they were about to send it. I could have fled. I could have gone somewhere safe. Mike stops at my desk just to say hi and offered me some leftover catering. I can't eat right now. But in this moment, Mike has offered me so much more than the leftovers. He has no idea what's going on, but can see in my face something is wrong. I ask to walk back to his office with him. Chris will never find me there. An hour or forever passes by. It's got to be done by now. I know Chris will be escorted back to gather his things. I don't want to be there for that. I sneak to Jay's office. He checks the area for me. Chris is gone. Jay heard from HR. As per HR, I'm not allowed to speak to anyone as to why Chris was fired. What the fuck? Are they serious? This leaves me so vulnerable. If Chris decides to come back to work, no one would stop him. In fact, they'd welcome him with open arms. And I'm left looking like the bitch that fired the nice, quiet kid. That week. The IT department took a few extra days to gather Chris's devices. I had time to look through them during that period. 
The day before our trip was one of so much discovery. Not just what I found on his computer, but what I learned from the people around me. The day after he was fired, I looked into his laptop. IT had no issues getting me into his files. I was Chris's boss and I needed his work. His pictures folder. A lot of personal stuff. Stupid memes, vacation pictures, screenshots of the naked cam girls he chatted with, and me. Some pictures that I'd never seen before, some I had. The pictures I was familiar with were from a cruise I went on months earlier with Johnny. Only, these were the ones I deleted. I had a GoPro set to take pictures every 10 seconds. It hung from my wrist. While walking around, I inadvertently took close-ups of my ass in a swimsuit. Upon importing my vacation pictures, I deleted those from my computer. Were they still on the card? Then, there were some pictures from my Google account. Well, it was a picture of a picture on a screen. He got into my Google account too. Why didn't I catch that one? Then the ones I had never seen. Pictures that had been taken around the office and on work trips. Me at my desk, me bent over, setting up gear. A close-up of a hint of cleavage shot from above. His phone was more of the same. A close-up of my ass while he sat behind me. Me struggling with an AV rack in a closet while in a dress. Video from under a table during a meeting while I'm wearing a skirt. Zoomed in upskirt photos. Pictures of dates that I'd written on post-its. Pictures of my phone settings showing my FetLife account. The nausea sets in again. I remember all of these moments in the pictures he'd taken of me. Him nonchalantly on his phone, looking like he was slacking off or answering an email. Little did I know, he was filling his spank bank with images of me during work hours and keeping a record of my days off. Fucking creep. I got to his browser history. It was sickening. He researched how to hack someone's text messages. He stalked friends of mine on Facebook, as well as my partner. He got into my Amazon, Gmail, Facebook, FetLife, work email, OkCupid, and bank account. He read old emails of past relationships, looked at the places I'd visited, and stalked images from events that I'd go to. There was hard evidence now. I took it to the local police near work. They couldn't handle it, so I went to the county prosecutor's office. Most people wouldn't think of that. It was suggested by Johnny's friend. They had a computer forensics department and could handle the case. I met with an amazing detective. He took my packet of evidence and listened to the whole story. It's becoming easier to tell the story especially when it's to focus on the facts. At my office, I learned more about Chris, how he slandered me to my coworkers. I knew I couldn't tell people I worked with why Chris was fired, but for my safety, I knew I had to tell a few people, just the ones close to me. Once they knew the story, I heard things from them like, Chris would complain that I didn't pay him enough. He lied and said that he made half of what he actually made to his co-workers. I even fought to get him an above-normal raise for two years. He lied and said that I withheld work from him. They usually responded to him by telling him to talk to my bosses or HR. Obviously, he never did. You can't take lies to HR and directors. He spread lies around the office coercing co-workers to take his side when I wasn't even aware there were sides to be had. From these people, I learned more about the obsession that Chris had with me. He craved to have power over me. He showed them my FetLife profile. He bragged about how compatible we were on OkCupid. Okay he even spoke about being obsessed with my partner. He told them how he tried to catfish me on Reddit. I couldn't blame them, though. 
Chris laid the groundwork and a bit of gaslighting on them. To them, I was a bad person, and Chris was their friend. Chris was really good at playing the victim, and never was able to take any self-responsibility. Nine months went by. I followed up with the detective often. It took a while to subpoena his devices from my company. They run forensics. In September, I get a call from the detective. They arrested Chris. They showed up early in the morning at his house where he lived with his parents, and he admitted to everything. He took the card from the GoPro and recovered the images. He got my passwords once when I walked away from my computer. He went through my phone when it was left at my desk. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. The shock to his family of the type of person he actually is. Him cowering while in handcuffs, face to face with what he'd done. No hiding behind a computer screen anymore. I was on vacation when this happened. I remember thinking, it's not long now till everyone at work will know. He's got a court date set. By then, it's public record. I can't help if people know after that point. I didn't have to wait that long, though. Later that day, co-workers started sending me links. Hey, didn't you work with this guy? What a creep. The link was to the county prosecutor's PR page, announcing Chris's arrest. Mugshot and all. I came back to work and was able to have the truth come out. It was liberating. It took another nine months for his final court date. I worked with prosecutors during that time to determine how I wanted to proceed. I opted for a probation period instead of going through a trial and fighting for jail time. While Chris deserves the jail time, he wasn't worth my time nor effort, and a trial would offer him a slim chance of getting off scot-free. Also, this way, he would get some much-needed counseling. Three years, no contact with me. Three years, sexual offense counseling. Three years of checking in with a probation officer. This way, I can at least hope that he will come out understanding that what he did was unacceptable. And, fingers crossed, will never do it to another living being again. I knew there was no chance of rehab in jail. The hearing. I, of course, was nervous. I didn't want to see Chris. But I knew whatever I was feeling, he was feeling a thousand times worse. I didn't have to go, but I knew that I would regret it if I didn't. With my fiancé, Johnny, at my side, I watched as he got up in front of the judge, after he cried in the courtroom, and agreed to the terms of his sentence. His mom glared at me the whole time, as though this was all my fault. So, that's where he gets it from. I believe I was about 16 when this took place, and it was in sixth form college here in the UK so I'm guessing it was in the spring or summer of 2001. It was either a Friday or Saturday night when I got a text asking what I was up to and if I wanted to go out. I had no idea who the text was from as the number wasn't saved in my phone and didn't have a name at the end of the text. I text back and got a call. Picking it up, I hear my friend Ong's voice. I was happy to hear from her as we went to secondary school together. I went on to college, and she decided to do other things, so we didn't see each other regularly anymore. She didn't have social media and refused to have a mobile phone. I praised her for finally getting with it and getting a phone. She burst my bubble when she said it was her friend's. We had a quick chat, it was probably about 10pm. I couldn't be asked to get ready, so I declined and said another time. Around 12am, I got another text. I thought she was contacting me again. The text read something along the lines of, Hey, this is Daniel, Ong's friend. I'm bored and stuck here till Ong wants to leave. I hope you don't mind me texting you. I didn't. 
At this age, I used to be up till stupid o'clock on the internet, and as he was a friend of my friend, I didn't see a problem. So he texted me for a bit, and it was kind of a nothingness conversation. Around 2am or so, I get a call. It's him. He said I sounded nice, and that he wanted to have a chat with me. Okay, cool. I'm still wide awake, so we had a chat. It was alright. We had a laugh. Talked about nothing much for a while, then said goodbye. The next morning, I get a text from him. I reply. He texts me all day and rings me again later. I find out more about him. That he works in the local shopping center in a certain store I went to all the time. The kind of stuff he likes, which is nothing like me, but whatever. We talk about where we live, as we live in different towns about 20 minutes apart by bus. At this point, he knows what I look like, as Ong had showed him photos of us she had, but he also saw my friendster page, which had current pictures of me. He, like Ong, didn't have social media back then, so I had no idea what he looked like, but he described himself. I didn't really care what he looked like, as I wasn't interested like that, but I had no problem in chatting to him. So this carries on for a week or two, him texting me and calling me to find out about me, asking lots of questions, which at the time seemed harmless enough. Around this time, I had time off of college for Easter holidays. He starts saying we should meet up, as both of us are free. I tell him I can't, as I have some coursework to do. This was only half true. I did have classwork to do, but I always leave it till the last minute. I was just busy being lazy and sitting about the house. He clearly didn't get the message, as he started texting me constantly. If I didn't reply to him fast enough, he sent more messages and would call. I told him I was so busy trying to do classwork that when I have time, I will text him. After a few days of that, I got a message saying, I had to go do something in your area. Let's meet. I told him I was busy and couldn't. He said that was okay, but then kept bombarding me with texts, urging me to meet him. No. Two days later, I get a message from him saying he's in my area again. We have to meet. No. The end of that week, he is there again, and once more, my answer is no. The start of the next week, he goes on about being in my area again. I ignore the text this time. Later that day, I get a call from a local area number. I pick up, and it's him. He says he's here and wants to hang out, and that I didn't reply to his text. I tell him I'm not at home, and I've been flat out, and I say once again that I will text him when I'm free. I found out the number he called from was a public telephone box on the main road that connects to the road that I live on. The constant texts were annoying, but I let them slide as I had no intention on meeting him. It was only a text. But to find out that he was actually literally in my area and knew roundabout where I lived, all the questions he was asking before that seemed harmless. All made sense now. He was narrowing down where I lived to the street, as I have a college at the bottom of my road and a park at the top. He knew this. He knew what bus I got from college, and the stop I got off at, which further narrows down the part of the street I lived on. He used to ask things about the clothes I wore and accessories I had, what patches were on my backpack and that kind of thing, so he would definitely know it was me if he saw me. Now this was not cool at all. I told him I'm not meeting him anytime soon, that I'm busy and he needs to chill the hell out as I don't need the hassle. This really put me off wanting to speak to him, as it was all fucking weird and I really should have told him to fuck off at this point. But when you don't really care about the person, other than to have a chat with, I just thought if I lessened the contact, he would get bored and piss off of his own accord. School started again, and I felt safer knowing that he couldn't be in my area when he had college quite far away from me. There would be no chance that I would run into him except for the shop I usually went to, which was near my college. I avoided going there, as there was nothing in there I couldn't get elsewhere. I really didn't want to go into the shopping center unless I had to, and that would be during school lunchtime, so he wouldn't be there. This wasn't because I was scared, 
I just didn't ever want to meet him, and I was starting to get pissed off the more I thought about it, and I didn't want to be nasty to him. So the texts continued. Over the next few weeks, I wouldn't reply to the majority of them, and when I did, they were polite. I stated that as I had exams soon, I didn't want the distraction. I then started to ignore his messages. They didn't stop. Another phone number I didn't know texted me. I asked who it was, and of course it was him from his mom's phone. He was really pissed off I replied to that text and not his. This was becoming a joke. During this time, one Saturday night, my mom rang me as I was coming home from a gig. She told me a boy I went to primary school called Morley rang to speak to me today. He asked if he could call again, and before the call ended, he also asked if I had a boyfriend. I was confused. Morley used to like me back in primary school, but we hadn't spoken since we left school at 11. Our moms did still chat occasionally, so I had no clue what the hell that was about. I get a call from Morley the next day. He tells me he's sorry for ringing me, but he really needs to ask me a question. He asked me if I had a boyfriend. I said I didn't. He then asked me if I knew someone called Daniel. I said yes, that I'd been speaking to someone called Daniel, but what started out as a pleasant chat and some texts had turned into way too much. He then went to tell me that Daniel goes to his sixth form and is loosely associated with his friend group. No one really likes him. Boys being boys, they were talking about girls. Daniel went on to talk about his girlfriend. They asked questions about her, and he told them who she was, what she looked like, what she was into, where she lived, and that kind of thing. He didn't think much of it. When he came back to school after the holidays, he had a bunch of clothes in his bag. They asked him where he was going, being as they wear uniform at their sixth form. He was bragging about how he'd come straight from hers as he stayed around her house a lot during the holiday. He told them in detail how he slept with her and got up to all sorts. He used to entertain them with stories all about her, and after a while, he finally showed them her picture. It was my picture. Morley was livid on the phone. He said the stuff Daniel was saying that we had done was just plain nasty, and the stuff he was saying about me he didn't think was true. He wanted to confirm that. He told me he would ring me back in a few days. Daniel was still trying to speak to me. After hearing from Morley what he'd been up to, I'm clearly not going to answer. I set the number to divert. I don't know if you could block numbers back then, but if you could, I didn't know how. I ignored the messages he sent me. I didn't even open them. I got home from school Monday afternoon at about 6 o'clock, and I got a call from Morley who again was pissed off, but was delighted. He told me he just got home and that Daniel had come into school with clothes in his bag again that morning. He said how he'd been staying at mine and that we slept together again. At that point, Morley, in front of everyone, said, You have never been to her house. And of course Daniel was adamant that he had. Morley replied, It must have been a Wendy house, as he knows for certain that he has never been to my house. He told Daniel that he knew me and had spoken to me yesterday, confirming that I am not his girlfriend. He brought up the fact that he has never met me, he's only spoken to me, and how I refused to meet him. I have been pretty much ignoring him as he kept turning up where I live to try and spot me. This did not go down well, obviously, as he had been made to look like a complete fucking twat. That night, my phone wouldn't stop with texts and calls from his number. He wouldn't stop calling. I told my mom everything after Morley called, as she wanted to know what it was about. At 11pm, Daniel called again. I gave the phone to my mom, and she picked up. He was sounding all in a panic, saying he needed to talk to me. She said no, that I was in bed, and it was inappropriate to call at this time. Not only that, but to not call me ever again. The number was put on divert and I was still getting voicemails. I texted him and told him to leave me alone, that it really is enough now. I know what he did and that I don't want to know him. 
He went quiet till around 2am, where he started calling again from a third number. I was asleep and my mom was awake. The call woke me up, so I called her in. She picked up the phone and went mental at him. She said she knows all about it and to leave me alone, or there will be trouble. He still texted after that. My mom was beyond livid and at 6am, she rang his mom's mobile, woke her up and told her all about what her son was up to. She was initially pissed off to be woken up so early, but when my mom laid it out, she just went quiet and said, I'm sorry, I will deal with it. I didn't hear from him again after that. Ong called me. I hadn't spoken to her since that first night, probably just over a month ago. She said she found out what had happened, I think from his mom. She wanted to know the validity of the call she received and was so incredibly sorry. She said that he wasn't even really her friend. They knew each other from primary school and he lived close that he just turned up at her house and imposed himself on her. Her mom would always let him in, despite her warning her not to, as she was fond of him, so Ong just put up with it. She did say in the past, when he was in secondary school, he became obsessed with a girl in their area and used to effectively stalk her. The mother of that girl complained to his mom, but his mom just thought he was young then and didn't think he did stuff like that anymore. Clearly, he didn't change. So, Daniel, for a 17-year-old, you were a fucking wronger. I dread to think what you're like now. Alright, so check this out. I had just moved out of a share house in the suburbs and into my own crappy one-bedroom apartment in the city. I'm a male, and at the time, I was about 25 years old. My apartment, while old and small, was located about 500 meters from one of the most popular night spots in the inner city. As I was in my mid-twenties and out on my own, this was the perfect place for me. This was because my friends and I were quite social and would frequent bars and nightclubs in the city and the taxi fares were starting to add up. Also, this new apartment was close to my work, so it made sense. I got settled in right away and invited my friends over for pre-drinks before hitting the clubs. Due to the limited space in the apartment, this meant that some friends were inside and some were drinking on the walkway just out front. We had the music up, and I had just started drinking, but between songs, I could hear the couple next door arguing. Now, the apartment was old and crappy, which meant thin walls, too, so I pressed an ear to the wall in order to listen in. I hadn't met any of my new neighbors at this time, as I didn't take long to move in, and I really didn't see anyone daring. I was curious. Judging from what I could determine while eavesdropping, they were a gay couple in their early 30s. One of the men was yelling at the other to go next door and to tell us to keep it down. The other was arguing that it was just a housewarming and to let it go for the night. Since I didn't want to cause trouble, I marshaled everyone outside to start making our way to the nightclubs, leaving my new neighbors in peace. Later that night, I came home alone as I was tired from the move. I decided to let my friends carry on partying without me. I arrived at my door and proceeded to fumble around for my keys when I looked up to see a man standing on the walkway in front of the next apartment, smoking a cigarette. He was tall and thin with brown, oily hair. I noticed that he also had a cut lip and a faded but still visible black eye. I said, G'day, sorry about the noise earlier correctly assuming he was my neighbor. He replied, Nah, you're alright mate, I'm Chris, and he shook my hand. I noticed his knuckles were red and a little bit scratched up, so I knew that something was off. I apologized for the noise and said, I hope I didn't cause any trouble for you. He withdrew his hand and with a soft but cracking voice said, Nah, that's okay. Rick just gets a bit cranky sometimes. I'm used to it. With that, I finished off the conversation and told Chris that I'd see him later. 
It was about 2 a.m. at this point and I just wanted to sleep but couldn't help worrying about the potential domestic abuse going on next door. I decided to just keep an eye on it for now as I didn't have all the info and for all I knew, he could have gotten into a fight with somebody else. As the weeks passed, I noticed that my new neighbors got drunk regularly and would argue almost every time. I could tell that Rick was the dominant one as his voice was a lot deeper and Chris seemed to be afraid of him during their shouting matches. This is why I kept my distance and never really socialized with them. I would even overhear them arguing about me and that Rick thought that Chris liked me, so on. I would just tune all of this out with headphones and video games, not to mention an active social life and full-time work to keep me occupied. I did find myself avoiding having guests over because of the neighbors. I would opt to meet people out as their arguments could be quite upsetting. This was working out fine enough for a while until Christmas Eve that same year. I was arriving home after having come from last minute Christmas shopping. I was getting ready for a night of present wrapping as I was to visit my family the following day for Christmas. As I arrived home, I noticed two police cars outside and Anna, an Asian woman who lived a few apartments up from Chris, was screaming. I asked her what was happening and all she said was, it's just so sad, while sobbing. I could see three officers trying to restrain somebody and there was blood on their uniforms. I came just a little bit closer to see Chris's oily brown hair in the center of the affray. His face was bleeding from his jaw where he had apparently been slashed by something sharp. They got him to his feet and I could see that his cheek had been cut so deep that the skin was flapping open as he struggled and resisted with the police. I recoiled in shock and went to comfort Anna, who was crying uncontrollably at this point. Suddenly, Rick's voice boomed out from nowhere. You see what you've done, you loser? Just off yourself already. This frightened me and my instinct was to get myself and Anna to safety. Even though the cops were here, they had their hands full with Chris, and I certainly didn't want to get involved in such an ugly fight where knives were involved. Anna refused to come with me and said that she would be fine. I looked around to see where Rick was as he kept yelling at Chris the whole time that the three cops struggled to restrain him. I could hear Chris whimpering apologetically in between. I couldn't see where Rick was so I decided just to go to my apartment and lock the door. As I turned to go, I froze in horror as Rick's voice boomed, where do you think you're going? A deep chill went down my spine as my brain struggled to reconcile the fact that these words were coming out of Chris's mouth. I felt panic grip me as I realized that all this time Rick and Chris were the same person. All the fighting, laughing, drinking, and carrying on that I couldn't help overhearing over the last couple of months had come from one solitary person, a lonely guy in a small one-bedroom apartment. For some reason, this made me feel sick. I learned later from Anna that this wasn't the first time the police had come out to take Chris away. Anna explained that he spends a couple of months at the local psychiatric hospital each time. His father owns the apartment, so it's here waiting for him when he gets out. I moved out a few months later, and while it is a sad situation for Chris, and I really do feel for him. Let's not meet. I lived in North Carolina for the past 10 years of my life, mainly in one of the big cities. I used to live in a not so great area of the city. It was so bad that I got sexually assaulted and one of my neighbors got murdered. So I'm used to the not-so-friendly people in the not-best of places. Around seven years ago, my parents got better jobs in a different part of the city, and I went to a school in the same area, and it's a lot nicer. I feel safe enough to chill outside late at night, and everyone is pretty friendly. Still, we're cautious. I'm trained in karate, my dad owns two shotguns, 
and we have a 130 pound American Akita named Jax. Honestly, he's scary looking, but he's a big baby. There's a neighborhood cat he's best friends with, and he cries when people don't pet him, but he can be scary. The first time he barked, I nearly shit my pants. Because he's so big, people tend to stop and ask about him when I'm walking him. They'll come up and ask the typical questions about what breed he is, how much he weighs, and all that stuff. He normally sits there and loves the attention. Everyone in my neighborhood is friendly for the most part, and they know me as the girl with the gigantic dog. One evening in mid-June, I'm walking jacks and listening to my music when we cross the road, and this guy is parking in his driveway. He's older, probably in his mid-forties, and he waves at us. I wave back and try to continue on my way, but he approaches me. I groan internally and yank out my earphones as he walks over, all smiles. What kind of dog you got there? He asks, and I notice he's covered in what looks like engine oil. An American Akita, I respond, trying to keep it short and simple so I can get back home and eat dinner, but this man keeps talking. Jesus, he's a big one. How old is he? he asks, and I tell him he's six years old, and that he was born on Christmas. The man nods and smiles, and I notice that something is up. Jax, for once, is not sitting down and wagging his tail, begging for attention. Instead, he's pulling on his leash and trying to drag me away. I assume he just wants to finish his walk, so I tell the man bye, and turn to walk away when he yells after me. Wait. Can I buy your dog? He asks. I'll give you $600. I turn around and look at him with a shocked look on my face. Until then, no one had ever asked to buy my dog from me. Sorry, I stammered out. He's not for sale. I tell him, and Jax is still tugging on his leash. I'm starting to get creeped out. Who just asks to buy someone's pet from them on the street? The man frowns and crosses his arms. Ah, uh, well, do you want some vodka? He asks. Sir, I'm 17, I tell him, starting to back away. He laughs and shakes his head. Come on, I won't tell. Loosen up a bit, girl, he says, and he grabs my arm and starts pulling on me. Just then, Jax comes whipping around and starts barking like mad. This guy lets go and starts cursing at me, and Jax is still losing it. I've got tears in my eyes and I start running up the street back to my house, dragging Jax with me who's still barking. At this point, his really deep and animalistic bark has attracted the attention of all the other dogs in the neighborhood, and as I'm running about two blocks to my house, there's about a dozen dogs barking in their yards and houses. I got home locked the door and told my mother what happened, while Jack stood at the window for a good 30 minutes, just staring at the street. It's been a year since that happened, and I don't walk Jack's that way anymore, but I did notice that the house has been foreclosed on. This happened to me around the age of 10, it still makes me feel uneasy. My parents were out of town, and my brother, who was five years older than me, was supposed to be watching me. Yeah, that didn't happen. So he's out doing God knows what while I'm home alone watching TV in the basement. There are two windows in the living room basement. It probably didn't help that I was watching America's Most Wanted and freaking myself out. Suddenly, I hear the gate to the backyard which is near me in the house, open. I think, that's odd. Why is my brother coming around the back? This was long before cell phones, by the way, so I can't text him to see what's going on. I see these massive feet, huge boots, slowly walking in the first window closest to me. I immediately feel uneasy. I turn off the TV so I can hear and see better. My heart is pounding. I hear someone move along the side of the backyard, and now I see the same massive feet in the second window. They paused. I am terrified. 
I wonder if my brother is pranking me, but I'm too scared to be mad, and they seemed way too big. The boots keep moving. I don't hear or say anything because I'm frozen with fear. I now hear someone coming down the basement steps towards the basement door next to me. I hear the rattle of the knob, but the door is locked. I hear a pound on the door. I'm so freaked out, but I lay there silently. A few seconds go by and it's quiet. Then I hear the footsteps go up the stairs. I know this guy is still in the backyard somewhere, but I don't know what to do. I hear the footsteps going up another set of steps toward the upstairs back door. Same thing again. Rattle of the knob and banging. Then the steps coming around the side of the house closest to me. This part is the freakiest. The boots stop at the window closest to me, and I see his knees bend to crouch down and look in the window. I was so scared that I threw my blanket over my whole body, hoping I'd just disappear. It was quiet for some time, and I didn't dare move. I am certain he was looking at me from above, and felt that uncanny feeling of being watched. Moments later, I heard the gate shut, and he was gone. I have no idea what would have happened if one of those doors were unlocked. I'm still pissed at my asshole of a brother for leaving me alone that night. This happened last night. My wife and I live in a very popular city in Texas and have lived here for three years. We were in bed prepping for the next morning. We were going to bed early and waking up at 6 a.m. to work out. We pass out pretty soon, about 10 p.m. Around 2.30 in the morning, my wife starts shaking me to wake up. Babe, the police are here, she says. I barely open my eyes to the lights in the window. I think it's just a thunderstorm. No, it is the police. What is going on? I see the lights flaunting around, and now I'm alert. We hear them from our bedroom on the second floor, stomping around outside in this outdoor courtyard we have, enclosed by our garage and kitchen, as well as the guest room and neighboring wall. They shout that they're about to come in and put down any weapons. I shout back to come in, and then I'm coming down. My wife is following me down the hall. I ask her to stay back just in case it's not the police. I come down the stairs half naked, turn the corner to the kitchen with my hands up facing a bright flashlight. The series of questions being asked is all a blur. Aside from who's present, if we're being held hostage to present my ID, there's about three officers all decked out searching our downstairs. They mention that the guest room looks like it was rummaged through and to check it out. I look in and verify that it usually is like that. My wife then comes down and the officer with the flashlight is briefing us on why they're there. They got a call about suspicious activity. People walking up and down our street checking front doors to see if they're unlocked. Apparently they've gotten a lot of reports lately on theft on our block and a lot of drug use and homeless in our area. Our garage door was wide open and all of our doors including our cars were unlocked. They wish us a good night and apologize for waking us up. We thank them and they leave as we close the garage door behind them. We then double check our front door and garage twice before we go to bed that time, so that we're 150% sure that it was closed. There was a couple instances in the past before our garage got repaired where the door opened while we were at work. So our garage doors are apparently malfunctioning again. I text our landlord immediately to create some sense of urgency for when he wakes up. My wife and I aren't able to sleep for the rest of the night, and obviously don't make it to the gym in the morning. Our landlord replies back around 2 p.m. that he'll check it out and get a tech out here ASAP. I follow up in the evening and he replies, I couldn't find anything. Working on getting a tech out there. Not sure exactly how to test that. I'm really upset by the lack of initiative, and it's past midnight now and my wife is snoozing, but I can't sleep. We locked all the doors, triple checking everything, but I still can't shake the feeling that we're going to get woken up again. Every little creak and noise is enough to keep me on the edge.
This happened to me a long time ago, but I think about it from time to time, and I've used a story to teach my kids to never open the door for people that you don't know. I was a kid, and we lived in a really big old house that was part of an old farm. It was on a semi-busy road, but was rural. The house was really big and had a large formal living room with a large formal dining room right behind it. There was a big double front door that opened to a covered porch and a side door that went into the dining room. My mom was doing laundry in the very back of the house and I was watching TV in the living room. There was a knock at the side door. I wasn't supposed to open the door, but I figured I could peek and see. I looked through the curtain on the side door and I could not believe my eyes. It was the Easter Bunny. Of course, looking back now, I know it was a guy in a costume, but back then, I thought it was real. When he saw me, he did a little hop and asked me to let him in. I was kind of in shock and just stared at him. He was in a pink suit and had a basket with eggs in it on his arm. He knocked again and acted really impatient and then said, little girl, are you gonna let me in so I can hide these eggs for you? I wanted those eggs, but he was a stranger, right? But again, he was the Easter Bunny. Can the Easter Bunny be a stranger? So I asked him who he was. He sighed and said, I'm the Easter Bunny, and you have to let me in right now so I can hide my eggs. Invite me in, or you won't get any. I reached out to unlock the door, but then I got a sick feeling in my stomach and decided I should probably check with my mom first. So I told him I was going to go ask my mom. He said, no. You have to let me in. I'm here to see you. These are for you. I thought about it, and he started to freak me out, so I yelled for my mom and ran to tell her. I run back to the laundry room and tell my mom there's an Easter bunny at the front door, and he wants to come inside the house. My mom laughs and says, well, let me go see. So she walks to the front door, and of course, the bunny is gone. Like, no trace of him. So my mom thinks I'm a big fat fibber and maybe sit on the couch and think about being a liar. Hours later, my dad comes home from work and he tells my mom there was a robbery a couple of miles away. A little boy had opened the door and a man had tied him and his mom up and then robbed them. I found out later that the guy had beat up the mom pretty badly. There was no mention of a bunny suit, but what better way to get a kid to let you inside? That was strike one for that house. Back when I was in college, I had a group of three friends who I hung out with, and I'm pretty sure we were a massive nuisance for most of the tutors and stuff, because we pissed about non-stop. We took nothing seriously, and were constantly getting mixed up in things we shouldn't have. Rewind back to my first year, our college was in a pretty rural area, off the roads quite a bit, and surrounded mostly by fields. Me and one of my friends, Adrian, waltzed on down to the far reaches of the college and climbed on top of one of the old equipment sheds and then on top of one of those concrete squared buildings that holds the generators. We saw a guy in the distance hopping over one of the fences. He looked pretty old and not like someone from our college. We just kind of sat up there using it as a vantage point to each lunch and we were watching this guy. He makes eye contact with us and starts coming over. He climbed the same bit we were on, hopped up and just said, hey, and grinned at us. He stank and ended up sitting right next to my friend, uncomfortably close. We both looked at each other and together hopped down off the thing. We started walking back to the college building without saying anything. He started shouting at us, saying, hey, where are you guys going? But we just kind of blanked him and kept on going. We told the tutors when we got back, but they didn't believe us. They just assumed we were messing about as usual. And then one of the tutors called John gave us a lecture about climbing on top of things and health and safety. So, yeah, I have no idea who this guy was or what that whole thing was about.
About six years ago, I was working at Target as asset protection. About an hour before my shift ended, I was walking around the store on a slow weeknight. There were not many customers. Once I finished my shift, I went to the grocery area to get a few things. While I was at the register, waiting to check out, I see this man standing between the entrance and exit. He was looking at me. We made eye contact. I realized that I saw this man earlier and that he'd been in the store for a long time. He had no bag or anything. He was just standing there. I thought it was weird, but not too weird, since some people will be there just to kill time. I look over at him again while I'm checking out. He was now by the bathrooms, but he was still looking at me. After I check out, I'm walking towards the exit, and as I'm about to enter the vestibule, the man is right beside me, slightly behind, almost touching me. He starts talking to me about the weather, and at this point I'm weirded out. Once we're outside, he asks me if I'm walking to my car. He's still walking, almost touching me, still making small talk. Then he grabs my elbow with his left hand and puts his other hand in his jacket pocket. I immediately turn around and say I forgot something inside the store, and I walk back inside. I told the leader on duty and stayed in the store for another 30 minutes. I asked her to walk with me to my car. The next day, I went on the cameras to see when the guy came in and when he went after our interaction. I could see a bulge in his right pocket from the footage of him entering. He was in the store for over an hour and I realized watching the footage that he was always in the area I was in within the last 30 minutes or so of my shift. Before that, he was in the women's purses area looking like he was watching people. He wasn't looking at the merchandise. His car was one spot away from mine, which was weird because employees had to park farther away from the store. It wasn't busy, and there were a lot of spots closer to the store. I could see myself turn around on camera and walk back towards the store. He walked quickly to his car and left immediately. I don't know what he was doing or what he was reaching for in his pocket. I'm tall for a woman, and this guy was quite a bit shorter than me which I think is why I didn't perceive him as much of a threat initially. He was older too, early to mid-fifties. So these incidents started about six years ago and went on for a couple of years. I used to be really into the music scene going to shows and festivals every chance I got. This often meant meeting random people whose names I would forget five seconds later, etc. As a result of being out in Atlanta nightlife so often, I got frequent friend requests on Facebook. Naive younger me blindly accepted them, assuming they were just people I had met at shows that I was too drunk or distracted to remember. One day, I got a message from someone named Eddie. His Facebook profile picture was of someone at least a decade older than me, with long, scraggly hair. He looked harmless enough, just another show-going hippie, I assumed. His message simply asked if I was the girl that danced a half-circle around him at the local show last night, and then twirled dreamily away, or something along those lines. This was back in 2012, so I don't remember exact words. I had responded that I had no recollection of that, and upon further investigation, I saw that he lived in an entirely different state, so it couldn't have been me. He said that I must have a doppelganger out there somewhere, and I left the conversation at that. Over the next few months, I'd get random notifications that he had messaged me, asking if I'd be at various shows across the southeast, etc. I mostly ignored the messages, but would very occasionally respond, shortly expressing interest in a band he had mentioned, just trying to be polite. Why younger me felt the need to be polite to everyone is beyond me. I have since learned that it's okay not to respond to persistent internet strangers. The messages became more and more frequent, so I just started to leave them unread. Again, why I didn't block him is beyond me. 
I guess I thought he was just harmless and lonely. Fast forward about a year. It's summer of 2013. Two of my best friends and I are caravanning to Wakarusa, a music festival that took place in Ozark, Arkansas. It was about a 13-hour drive from Atlanta, but totally worth it. We went every year. An important note here is that this wasn't some small, intimate festival. It hosted upwards of 40,000 people, and it was often hard to keep track of my friends, let alone find people I knew who came separately. So my friends and I are on a blanket in the middle of a huge crowd, watching widespread panic. It's nighttime, so the only lights are coming from the stage, random LED toys or glow sticks or whatever. Out of nowhere, someone beelines for our blanket, makes himself at home next to me without permission, and strikes up a conversation. My group of friends is generally warm and accepting, and it wasn't unusual to make random friends at a big hippie fest like this, so we thought nothing of it at first. Probably just someone high on ecstasy and looking for company. It wasn't until he started referencing me, my Facebook, personally, that the alarm bell started going off. This was Eddie. I had honestly completely forgotten about him and his persistent messages. In the darkness, there was no way I could have recognized him. He was talking like I was an old friend and tried to follow us around all night. Once I subtly alerted the others about who he was, we made every excuse in the book to try to leave, go back to our campsite, call it a night. He was painfully insistent on following us back there and continuing to hang out. Obviously, I didn't want him to know where I slept, so I tried to appease him by saying I was exhausted, but that we can try to meet up tomorrow. Again, dumb, I know. I was just doing anything I could to get him away in that moment. I had no intention of actually following through. He finally left us alone and we walked a long roundabout way to our campsite, just in case he had watched or tried to follow at a distance. The next day, I made an avid point to avoid the area where we ran into Eddie, discussed meeting up. The festival venue was huge, so I figured there was no way he'd find me again. I was beside a small stage in the back corner of the venue, hooping in the woods with my friends, when I noticed him out of the corner of my eye. He was standing beside a tree alone, watching me with a weird smile. It reminded me of a proud dad watching his young daughter play, but with way creepier and more sinister overtones. Still, he hadn't done or said anything explicitly creepy or threatening, but his presence was so unsettling that I grabbed my friends and we pretended that we had forgotten about a set that was starting. So we ran out of the wooded stage area. I remember hoping he didn't notice I had seen him. The festival ended the next day and I was relieved not to see him again. Fast forward about another year. At this point, I barely used Facebook and had all but forgotten about Eddie. My friend that I went to the festival with was visiting from out of town that night and we were going to go get some drinks. He got to my house and we were catching up and the subject of the festival came up. We started talking about Eddie and how weird the whole situation was, but at this point, it was less creepy and more of just a strange memory. I told him Eddie used to message me all the time, but that I had stopped opening them years ago. Naturally, my friend wanted to look through the messages, so I obliged. We began to scroll through the messages, and I realized just how dire of a mistake it may have been not to block him. He had started by asking me what shows I was going to, what part of Atlanta I lived in, etc. Not taking the hint that I clearly had no interest in responding at that point. Then, as the months went by, he was sending me links to tickets he had bought for me to shows in Atlanta. And then, tickets that he had bought for us to go to together. There was one message asking where he could pick me up for a show that was two hours away in Athens, 
and that he couldn't wait to see me again. The messages continued to go on, but at this point, I was so creeped out I immediately blocked him, finally, and closed the computer, wide-eyed. What the actual fuck? He sounded like he was carrying on an entire relationship without my consent. He never acknowledged the fact that I literally hadn't responded or even seen a message from him in over a year. Shaken up, we decided to just go get a drink and stop thinking about this weirdo. We get to Edgewood, a popular bar district in my city, and walk to our favorite small bar to get a drink. As soon as we walk into the bar, my heart sinks to the pit of my stomach. To this day, this was the creepiest, most coincidental moment that has ever happened. I see Eddie sitting at the far end of the bar. His face lights up as soon as I walk in, and he motions me over. He says something along the lines of, I can't believe it's you, and starts firing off questions about me, my life, what I've been up to, etc. At this point, the darkest feeling washes over me. I just feel unsafe and exposed. Why is he here? He doesn't even fucking live in Georgia. I quickly tell him I have to use the restroom, but then I'll be back to the bar for a drink. I grab my friend equally in shock, and we speed walk around the corner to the bathrooms and then past them. I will forever be grateful that the door to the patio area was just past the bathrooms. So we got a head start. We get outside, hop the fence, and start running to my car. I glance behind us and Eddie somehow figured out in those 15 seconds that we left, even though you can't see the bathrooms from where he was sitting. And he is walking rapidly across a crosswalk in our direction, eyes on me. We fucking book it to my car and get the hell out of Edgewood as quickly as we can. Shaken. I drive us around for about an hour before eventually going home to make sure we weren't being followed. As inconclusive as the whole thing was, that was the last time I ever saw Eddie, and I often wonder if this was just a string of coincidences, or if it was more sinister. After all, he didn't even live in Georgia. Why was he at one of my favorite bars alone the night I happened to go through all his old messages? Had he somehow gotten a hold of my location via Facebook? I made sure all my location services were off when I checked my phone, so to this day, I have no idea how he ended up there or what his intentions were. But regardless, Eddie, let's please not meet again. This happened last year around mid-May. I had just got home from getting my son his first haircut. I had just laid him down for a nap in his crib and laid down in my bed myself. I heard the front door handle rattle. I never locked my door during the day, but today I had, which is so strange I don't even remember doing it. It rattled a few more times. My window in my room that is level with the head of the bed faces the porch. So I peeked out and I saw a really tall guy trying to peer in my other window. Then he just sat in the chair I have on my porch, literally right by my window that my head was next to. I honestly did not hesitate to call the police because I don't own a gun and my baby was in the home. I didn't want to risk being confrontational. After about six minutes on the phone with the dispatcher, whispering the details to her, a police officer came. He tried to run and they arrested him. I was later told he had a warrant for burglary. I am a 28 year old male living in the deep cell. I am a functional, medicated and therapy attending paranoid schizophrenic. However, I wasn't always this way and this story comes from a time before I even knew what was wrong. It was about April 2007 when this happened. 
I had just come out of a painful divorce. She had taken all of my friends away from me in the process. I was, obviously, trying to reach out to anyone I could, but I had severe codependency issues that I didn't know how to address. Anyway, I found myself wandering the game section of my local Walmart, as I am still a gamer at heart. I had to see what was available. Things were going alright. I seemed to be in control of myself. Then he appeared. This poor, unsuspecting soul started talking to me about World of Warcraft, which I happened to play. I perked up at this point, thinking I could make a friend, a new friend that hadn't been taken from me. We made casual jokes and talked about the new expansion. At this point his mother came by and took him to another aisle. He didn't say goodbye, he just walked off. And just like that, our conversation was through. Well, in my mind, we had made a connection. We had bonded. In my sick, twisted state, I thought he would appreciate if we hung out for a while, so I followed him. I made a point to casually stroll down the aisles that he happened to visit and strike up conversations with him about different things. Jokes, I can't remember. I could tell he was getting creeped out by the third time I'd done this. He started getting this deer-in-the-headlights look every time he saw me, and it was starting to become a horror story, though, in my eyes, it was perfectly natural. At some point, however, his fight or flight must have kicked in, because when I appeared, as soon as I opened my mouth to speak, he screamed, leave me alone, and stormed off, dragging his mother as quickly as he possibly could. This was a wake-up call for me, that I was being severely creepy and also a stalker. I realized that this could very well be the behavior that caused my divorce in the first place. I checked myself into a mental institution soon after, and I got the help I needed. I am now significantly better, and my relationships with people have improved greatly. I now have good friends and a loving fiancé. Not all creepers mean to be creepy. Some of us just need the proper psychiatric help. On behalf of all the unknowing and good intention creepers out there, I humbly and sincerely apologize for our behavior. It doesn't make it forgivable, but I hope it does give some context as to what goes on in the mind of a creeper. Thank you for your time. When I was 11, my family moved to a very rural area in Minnesota in 1990 after living in a city in Wisconsin. We were surrounded by cornfields and it was about 45 minutes to any larger town or city. I just want to set the scene a little because as a young kid who was used to the city, it definitely added to the creepy factor at night. What made it even worse at night for me was that a lot of times I was left alone. My mom was a night shift nurse and my dad was a truck driver. I would leave the TV on, playing Nick at night, so I could fool myself into thinking that my mom was in the living room, watching shows. I would also sleep in their room because it brought me comfort and it was closer to the TV. Some may disapprove of this, but at the time, there wasn't much to do about it. My parents needed to make money and this is what they chose to do. Anyway, it was like this often, but one weekend my dad was home which doesn't happen much. So this meant I was in my room, which is right near the front door. My dad was in their bedroom, towards the back of the house. We had a Springer Spaniel, who was my best friend, and slept with me often. One night that weekend, I woke up with him not on my side, and could hear what sounded like a dog, my dog, growling and whimpering. I got up, walked to the kitchen right outside my room, and looked towards the front door. In the entryway, I saw the head of a man bent down near my dog, and I said, Hello? Not sure what the hell I was thinking as a young girl. I should have ran to my dad, but I was worried about my dog, I guess. He stood up, looking startled. I don't remember what he looked like very well, but he was probably in his 40s or 50s, short and looked a little disheveled. He asked me where the nearby town was, and I told him that I didn't know, but I could get my dad. The man had taken a few steps forward and my dog growled. He then said that he would figure it out 
and walked out the door. I ran to get my dad, and needless to say, my dad was really upset that I didn't come get him right away. The man never came back, that I know of. I don't know if he somehow knew that I was usually home alone and tried to come in, or if maybe he was drunk and entered the wrong house, thinking it was his. It was definitely pure luck that this strange guy came into my house on a weekend that my dad was home. I know for sure that my dog may have saved me from something awful happening. I still wonder what he was doing bent down that would make my dog whimper like that. I also wonder what would have happened if I had not heard my dog. Anyway, that's my story. It's definitely creepy for me. So my therapist insisted that I tell this to stop being scared and mad at it. The being pissed off at this memory doesn't have anything to do with the story, so I won't really be telling it. Back in late 2020, it was probably around fall, maybe September, I was living in what is called a host home. Basically someone or a person lets you live in their house while you try to build a better future for yourself. I was left alone one night when I heard creaking upstairs. I get creeped out easily, so I kept having to brush it off, but everything was heightened in fear because I'm basically blind. My glasses were broken and I was waiting for new ones in the mall. I was sitting on my computer doing schoolwork or something when I heard footsteps outside. I was slightly freaking out, so I called my friend to talk with me. I kept telling myself it was a cat or small animal that kept coming around the property. Well, while I was on the phone, the back door light flashed on. It was a movement sensor. So I turned around and saw this thing on all four staring at me. I flipped out because it looked like a blurry, naked human to me. My friend heard me yell and kept yelling for me to call the cops. I ended up calling the cops and they did find footsteps on some of the mud, but concluded it might have been there before, as the owners frequently did gardening. I told them everything I knew, and they stated that it was a good thing I called. Better to be safe than sorry. Nothing was found on the cameras, but a week later, some guy was found high in the park nearby, completely naked and bald. Just like the thing I saw. In my early 20s, I was staying with a friend in Northern California, Lake County, Mendocino area. The first night I get into town, my friend picks me up and we make the trek to his house. As soon as we get there, he gives me the tour. Two story house, probably five bedrooms from what I can remember. As he shows me the guest room in the basement, a looks come over his face. It looks like it's been ransacked, he says. We talk about it, but he just brushed it off. So I decided to sleep on the couch. He had to drop off his friend at the airport at 5 a.m. the next morning. So I sleep in and wake up to scratching sounds coming from the window. I lay there for a few minutes just listening. It's obviously something at this point. In my boxers, I decide to investigate. That's when I see a figure with a crowbar trying to pry open the kitchen window. There's no landline and I had no cell phone. The blinds are open so I have to sneak into my friend's room, which meant I had to go through the kitchen. He had a sliding glass door that opened right onto the second story balcony where the kitchen window was. I'm looking frantically for anything to defend myself and notice a samurai sword. So here I am in my underwear with a sword, hiding behind a tapestry he used as curtains for the sliding glass door, sizing this guy up at 8 a.m. That's when I hear the window give and pop open no choice, I stepped out, ripping open the slider door, sword drawn, ready to go last samurai on this guy. He was so shocked. He must have been watching the house and knew that my friend was gone, but since I had gotten late, he didn't know I was there. He stumbled and fell down the steps, jumping the railing and ran. My friend had flower pots on the railing. I tossed them, nearly hitting him. The only proof I had was that one of the guy's tennis shoes came off in the chaos. This was the first and only time I ever used my emergency code with my mom. 
My dad was in a band, and some of his band members were in a country band that had a performance on the 4th of July. It was taking place on a ranch-type area near a highway. When I got there, I quickly realized that everyone there was either 20 years older than me or 10 years younger. I was 17 at the time, and so I realized that I was most likely going to be bored there for three hours. One of the band members' wives brought over a girl who looked to be my age. She introduced her to me and treated her like a friend. The girl, Sarah, started talking with me and asked if I would like to go for a walk around the field. I agreed and we set off. We started talking about school and it turns out she's a year younger than me and that she was homeschooled. I told her that I went to an all-girls Catholic school and she quickly started talking about how she thought most girls were pretty bitchy. And she was Catholic. She practiced witchcraft. I thought it was kind of weird, but I tried to be open-minded, so I wasn't judging her. We finally got to the side of the field that couldn't be seen by people at the event, but it was right next to the highway. There, we came across the body of a dead deer. She looked at me and said, I really wish I could take its hope. I wonder if I have any bags on me. I thought she was joking, but she reached into her backpack and pulled out a knife and a brown paper bag. She went over to the dead deer and started sawing at its foot, but she couldn't get it all the way through. She tried to get me to help her, but I said no, so she put down the knife and ripped the hoof off with her bare hands. At this point, I was freaking out because she'd just been talking about how she liked violence and didn't really care about people being hurt. She grabbed the hoof, put it in the bag, and then put that in her backpack. She was still carrying the knife. I tried messaging my mom, but there was no service where we were standing. We kept walking, and she was talking about how she would put curses on people she didn't like, and how she was completely desensitized to death and the killing of animals because she'd grown up on a farm where she had watched her mother cut the heads off of rabbits. We kept walking and came across a fork in the road. She said we should go one way, and she said she wasn't going to chop me into pieces or anything because that doesn't happen much these days. We finally got to a place where there was cell service. I texted my mom our code word. She told me to get back to the barbecue and we would leave right away. Sarah asked me when I had to leave. I told her that whenever my grandma got to our house, we would have to go home and meet her. I mentioned something about her bringing her dog named Buddy, and Sarah got excited about the name. She said she had a dog named Buddy, who she set free in the wild, and then he was eaten alive by coyotes, but it was okay because he died happy. We finally got back to where everyone else was, and my mom said that we needed to go home. Sarah then asked for my phone number as she had seen my phone. I agreed and put in a fake number before my parents and I walked away. As soon as we were out of sight, I ran to the car. My parents got into the car and asked me if she pulled out drugs or something. I wish. I would have known how to handle that. I've pushed this from my mind in the past couple of months, because any activity is seemingly stopped. Yet somehow I knew this silence was too good to be true, and eventually, we will hear from him again, sooner or later. It all started a few months ago. A guy messaged me on Facebook, and unlike the usual creepy messages I get, this one sounded intelligent and funny. We started chatting from time to time talking about anything and everything. He said he was divorced with one child, and I empathized every time he would complain about his ex-wife, even though it also kind of bothered me that he would tell all those personal details to a virtual stranger. After all, no matter what happened between them, she was still the mother of his child. Have some respect. We continue chatting, and I'm getting more relaxed. We're at the stage where we often discuss our daily lives and inevitably, I talk about my best friend with whom I am extremely close. We're like sisters. 
At that particular time, she's been very busy with changes happening at her work and some issues with a guy she met, but said things are complicated and she will explain in detail when there's more time to meet. Now, keep in mind that under normal circumstances, I would have known every little detail about that, but as it happened then, there wasn't sufficient time to properly see each other and talk, so I only knew the basics. No names, no pictures, etc. So I am talking to my guy, for the sake of privacy, we will call him Jake, and I start taking notice that every time we do, he would casually direct the conversation towards my best friend, Jenna. I have mentioned to him that we know each other since we were babies, practically grew up together, so he would always ask me to tell him funny stories from our childhood and teen years, then proceed inquiring about what she is like now, what kind of guy she likes, etc. I would jokingly ask if he got tired of me and wanted her number, but he would deflect it with awkward humor, so I didn't really think anything past that. Some time has passed and things are a bit calmer at Jenna's work, so we finally get to meet for drinks. Inevitably, we start discussing Jake. I tell her about him, and she is smiling and nodding, until I take my phone out and show her his pictures, and she goes pale in the face. She grabs my phone and says, This is him. This is the guy I told you about. At first I assume she's joking, as she's prone to messing with me, but she looks dead serious, so I start asking questions. Turns out, she met him on a dating app. They talked first and she was under the same impression, that he was smart, charming, and cultured, so when he eventually asked her out, she gladly accepted. They went out, had drinks, talked and everything was fine until by the end of the evening, he got a little too grabby and insistent for more than a goodnight kiss. He insisted to drive her home, even though she had her own car there, and suggested that he could pick her up in the morning to get her car. Since she didn't want him to know where she lived, and she was annoyed at his advances, she refused and managed to escape him somehow. She told me that she was afraid he would follow her home, so instead she went to a bar where a friend of hers worked after that. The next day he called her and apologized for his behavior at the end of the evening, blamed the drinks and the stress at his work, and then told her he had to admit something to her because he really liked her and wanted to be honest with her. She agreed and they met again. When he admitted that he was actually in the process of getting a divorce but hasn't yet filed for it, and he was still living with his wife and small child because she didn't have a job and he couldn't just leave her alone tending for their child before she was financially stable. Jenna, being the blunt gal she is, called bullshit at his story and accused him of being yet another married man out to cheat and using false excuses for sympathy. The guy worked as a sales rep, so he was really smooth and convincing. So I don't know how, but he managed to appease her doubts, at least to a point of not cutting him off right there and then. Some time passes and he chats to her online, calls her and they talk, but she tells him that the only way she could ever consider getting intimate with him would be if she sees proof that he is actually divorced and lives separately from his family. One day he calls her and tells her that he will put his wife on the phone to prove to her that even though they live together, they sleep in separate rooms and are technically separated. A woman's voice really confirms that, but it leaves Jenna more puzzled than reassured. She is conflicted because despite everything, she actually likes the guy and is therefore worried to not get herself into a mess if she falls deeper. She's still hesitant to accept his invitations to meet, so one day he accidentally walks past the place she works at exactly the same time she finishes work. What are the chances, right? And she agrees to go grab a drink as long as they talk and act platonic. He promises, and apparently that is also when she tells him more about her life, childhood, etc., and where I am brought up into the conversation. He listens attentively, and afterwards, when she and I compare timelines, it turns out exactly a few days after that, my guy starts to message me on Facebook. 
We are both livid and incredulous, so we decide to confront him separately and then compare notes. When I get back home, I text him asking why he lied to me that he was divorced when he clearly is still living with his family and more importantly, why he started talking to me when he was already seeing my best friend. He was unprepared for that, but he bounced back quickly and gave me some bullshit explanation how he was curious about me when he heard so much from Jenna and wanted to see what I looked like. So we went through her Facebook friends list and found me. Mind you, she hasn't added him on Facebook, so he basically stalked her profile to get that information. Just like she didn't exactly tell him where she worked, yet he knew how to accidentally walk past there. When Jenna confronted him, he told her that he was just curious and wanted to hear more about her from the person that knows her best, her best friend. She told him that it was wrong and creepy on so many levels, but he insisted he had no bad intentions and that he just liked her so much that his curiosity got the better of him, etc. WTF. When we compare notes after that, Jenna and I decide to just stop talking to him whatsoever because the guy is a liar and extremely weird. We each tell him that we don't want to talk to him or see him again. And even though he is shocked and tries to convince us otherwise, he eventually accepts that and says that if we change our mind, he will be happy to talk. We think that it's over. Oh, the naivety. At first he seemed to take it well, but then he would accidentally send a picture or a message which was intended for someone else, but mistakenly sent to me or Jenna, just so he could initiate a conversation. He would attempt to ask her or me out again, get refused, and then retreat again, until the next accidental message or call. Then the random bumping into each other ensued. Wherever we would go, on my way to work, at the market, at a cafe, at Jenna's gym, he would be there. Of course, it was all random coincidence. We started to get annoyed, more than anything at this point, but still thought he was a lying bastard, but still harmless. So there was not much we could do, except wait it out, thinking he would eventually move on. Wrong. One day Jenna comes at my place freaked out, and she tells me that she was on a date with a new guy she met, and she saw Jake passing by the restaurant she was in, and then later, he called her in hysterics, screaming at her. Look what you did. I can't get you out of my mind. Because of you, I got so angry that I hit my child and chased my wife out of the house in the cold. She got fed up with him, so she told him to never bother her again and go seek a therapist because he clearly has issues, then blocked him. That creeped us both out because not only wasn't he moving on, he seemed to have been escalating and getting aggressive. I told her that if he calls her again, she should threaten him with calling the police and reporting that he was allegedly abusive towards his family. We are in the middle of discussing that when I get a call from an unknown number and normally I don't pick up on those, but I was also waiting for a package delivery and thought it might be from the courier company. It was him. He was crying. He was sobbing on the phone, pleading with me to convince Jenna to unblock him that it wasn't fair and I had to help him. He sounded like crazy to be honest. I was shocked to hear him in this state. It was such a contrast to his normally smooth demeanor, so I calmly told him that he should act like a grown man and calm down. And that it is not my place to convince her about anything after she made up her mind, and especially after his crazy behavior and threats about hitting his child and chasing his wife out. He then told me that he really didn't do that, but he wanted to make Jenna feel guilty and scare her into talking to him, so he said that. He started apologizing profusely about it and said that he was at his wit's end and didn't know what to do. I told him that this has gone far enough and that he's a 35-year-old male, so he should act like it, and that if he ever proceeds contacting or stalking us again, 
We will go to the police. I hung up and blocked him. The police threat seemed to work, finally. We haven't heard from him for about two months. But yesterday, Jenna and I were at a birthday party at a club and just guess who was the birthday girl's plus one. I woke up around three in the morning to my dog ferociously barking. It startled me awake because he only barks like that when someone he doesn't know is in the house. After a short while, he stops barking. We are both intently listening for any noises. My heart is beating as I hear clicking sounds coming from the living room. I am undecided if someone is in the house. I am thinking maybe it's the fridge, but this is a distinct noise. It was really windy that night, so I was also thinking perhaps the wind blew something loose, but this was coming from inside the house, and no windows were open. I lay in my bed, frigid, with my eyes wide open and ears listening hard. My dog eventually jumps back onto my bed and falls asleep. I keep my bedroom door locked so I felt a bit safe, especially with my dog. I figured if he says it's fine, then it probably is. I don't hear any more noises, and eventually I fall back asleep. The next morning, I examine the living room for any possible culprits of the noise. As I'm looking around, it suddenly dawns on me. The door. I remember the door handle makes a clicking sound when it's pushed down. To be sure, I go to my front door and push down the handle. What I hear is what I heard the previous night. That light clicking sound, discreet yet distinct, someone was trying to enter my house. I had an aunt who lived in Cleveland, Ohio, and worked for some sort of agency, helping convicted criminals rebuild their lives after getting out of jail. I don't know the name of the place she worked, but I know they were involved in employment to felons as well as lower criminals. My aunt worked directly with the clients, finding out the kinds of things they were qualified to do, what skills they might have, what they enjoyed, that kind of thing. She had a lot of experience talking to people who'd done terrible things in their lives, but she never judged them for it or assumed that they would continue their criminality. The agency had to check for the clients to see if they were genuinely interested in changing their lives, so most of them really just wanted help in becoming legitimate. She had one client who had a very hard time with transportation. He didn't live anywhere near a bus station and thus had a hard time getting to and from the agency as well as to any job. In the months that my aunt worked with this man, they became friendly and at one point, she offered to help him with transportation when she could. This is how she ended up picking him up and dropping him off at his house. I assume that whatever the job they found for this guy was close to where my aunt worked, so she would just take him on her way home. She said he was always nice enough, kind of quiet and eccentric, but nothing too strange. At one point, when she dropped him off, he invited her in for a drink or something, but their professional relationship disallowed her from doing so. After a while, this guy apparently got on his feet and left the agency, fending for himself. My aunt pretty much forgot about it. After some period of time, my aunt sees this guy's face on television. The police had stormed his house and found a horror show inside. He had murdered something like seven girls and women, hidden them beneath his floorboards. According to the forensics, his victims had been killed at different times ranging from the very recent to before my aunt had known him. So basically, this guy was actively killing at the time she was driving him to and from his house. This terrible thing happened about 15 years ago. I was 20 years old and living alone. I came home from work, checked the post as I usually do, and found a sealed letter. It was a blank envelope. Inside, there were two tickets to a concert 
and a letter. A love letter. The writer's feelings for me were quite clear. It went something like this. Let's meet at the concert. I'll keep my identity hidden until we meet. I'm sure you'll be surprised. I'm someone you know. I had a boyfriend at the time, and I had no idea who wrote that. I thought for a moment that I won a competition or something. I remembered that I entered one. But then I remembered that I had entered that competition only this morning, so there's no way that the tickets could be in my letterbox by the evening. Something wasn't right, so I didn't go to the concert. I thought that if it truly is someone that I know, as soon as they reveal themselves to me, then I'd apologize, and I'm sure if they are a decent and kind person, they'd understand my caution. The day after the concert, I found a threatening looking letter stuffed into my letterbox. Why didn't you come? You idiot! Don't pretend like you aren't interested. This is BS. The first letter was gentlemanly in a sense, but this was the complete opposite. Back then, mobile phones weren't so common. As soon as I returned home from work, the moment I closed my front door, my home phone rang. I picked it up, and the other party hung up. This happened often. I didn't get a call or letter every single day. It was irregular. I would get one a week, and then the next week I'd get three or four. This kind of thing went on for about three months. It was so creepy that I ended up moving away. Finally, peace. Well, that's what I thought. Until one month after I moved into a new place, the same thing started again. I didn't get a call this time, but I found another blank envelope in my letterbox. There was no sender's address or name, so it must have been posted by hand. When I saw this, it was clear to me that I had a stalker, and the stalker had found my new home. I was really scared. I took the letter to the police station and spoke to an officer. Ignoring the other party is the most effective thing you can do. As soon as he realizes that he's being ignored, he will stop. This advice doesn't solve anything, I thought. Then the officer said, Look, women who live alone often get lonely, right? And sometimes single ladies have a tendency to allow harmless antics to get blown out of proportion. Hmm? He laughed and thought I was delusional. Back in those days, the word stalker wasn't widely recognized in Japan. The laws in place aren't what they are today. I felt so sad that he didn't try to help me. He didn't back me up. It was like he took the stalker's side. I'll just move again, I thought. But around that time, my boyfriend and I were talking about marriage. So I moved back to my parents' house while we talked it over. My parents' home was in the same prefecture, but it was way out into the sticks, so commuting to work was a real pain. But I thought, eh, at least I'd be rid of the stalker. I was wrong. Carnage and bloodshed were right around the corner for me. I finished work and headed towards the train station. On the way, a man stood blocking my way. When I tried to go one way, he stood in that way, and when I tried to go the other, he blocked me again. He towered over me. He was peering down at me. His jaw hung open, and he was breathing through his mouth. It's him. It's my stalker, I thought. But I didn't recognize him. Why didn't you come? He muttered. For a moment, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, and then suddenly I remembered. The tickets. I knew he wanted an answer, but I couldn't say a word. It was rush hour. People were all around us. I wasn't terrified, but I was scared. It was risky. So I said in quite a loud voice, for the benefit of those around, Excuse me, please let me pass. As I said this, people all around looked in our direction, but then my stalker did something unexpected. He turned and ran into the busy street. Right before my eyes, he was hit by a car. You may think this is quite cold-hearted, but I just thought as I rode the train home, that is not my fault. I was kind of happy that the harassment might be all over. In case you're wondering, he lived. However, one of the stalker's colleagues saw this all unfold. This guy said that it looked as if we were having a lover's quarrel. And when the stalker got hit by the car, he said that I pretended not to notice or feigned ignorance and just walked off. 
this rumor was spread around by the stalker's co-worker. Every year my company and other companies in the same line of work have a sports day for a bit of friendly competition. I remember talking to a few people, but there were so many people I can't remember who I spoke to very well. Apparently this is how I met my stalker. I'm usually really good at remembering faces, but I didn't recognize him. I found out that he came to my company a few times a week. I work in the personnel department hidden away in a small office, so I don't often see people other than the ones I immediately work with. Yet the rumors about me grew. They said that we often met at work. Of course I denied all these false allegations and stated the fact that I was the victim of stalking, but I wasn't convinced that anyone believed me. Another shock was in store for me. I was dumped. Although my boyfriend and I weren't officially engaged, we had set up a date for me to be introduced to his parents in his hometown. At that point, we would officially announce our plans to engage. The rumors had reached their ears before I had arrived. As I said before, the suffering caused by stalkers wasn't well documented in Japan. They said to me when I met them, You must have given this guy some sign that he had a chance with you. Somehow, you must have given him the wrong idea. You caused his actions. Are you sure there wasn't anything going on between you two? With this doubt and distrust imposed upon me, my boyfriend was persuaded by his parents to end our relationship. I couldn't believe it. I wanted to escape, I wanted a fresh start, so I resigned from my job as well. It has been over 20 years since this has happened, and the wounds caused by the stalker still feel fresh. My desire to work hard at the assumption that I would eventually get married and spend my life with a husband has died. I came to the conclusion that I would end up alone. So far I'm right. I recently inherited my mom's estate after she died, and I began staying there. It's been a pain in the ass dealing with emptying it out to sell it while working full time. Not to mention the hassle with the probate lawyers and my realtor. The icing on the cake has been dealing with this old woman living in the neighboring house. The first instance where I realized there was probably something wrong with her mentally was when she came onto my driveway to talk while I was filling up a rented dumpster with some junk from inside the house. She's going on and on about a plastic baton she gave to my little sister when she was a toddler. The old lady was desperate to give it to one of her nieces, so if I found it while cleaning, I was to return it to her immediately, all this over a dollar store toy. I was annoyed and she wouldn't shut up, so I made an excuse to go inside. After I said goodbye and shut the door behind me, I could hear her talking to me as if I was still standing there. Weird. A few days later, a truck comes to pick up the dumpster. My car was in the driveway, but I wasn't home to move it, resulting in the driver going over my lawn to reach the dumpster and leaving tire tracks. It's whatever, I don't care. Later in the day, the old lady's pounding on my door. She's furious and screaming that there's tire tracks on her lawn, but like I said before, it's not on her lawn, it's on mine. It's not even close to her property line. She insists it's her law, and I need to take care of the tracks ASAP. Okay, whatever, I'll fix it. Anything to get you to stop screaming and away from my front door. The next day I got to the house to find that she dug up the area where the track marks were. She planted grass seeds. Maybe she felt bad for yelling at me. I dismiss it. Although I do find it weird she's doing lawn work on property she doesn't even know. There are a few other small art encounters, and the fact that every time I stepped outside, she immediately comes out to try to engage with me, but I saved the weirdest for last. Like I said, I was living in the house my mom left, specifically in an upstairs bedroom. I live alone. One morning, I come downstairs. I find an envelope on the first step right by the front door. There's a card inside, signed with the old lady's name. She writes how she's sorry about my mom. She also lost her mom at my age, and it made her feel 
connected to me, along with some other I'm here for you type of stuff. But I didn't put this card here. It was not here when I went upstairs to go to bed. The only explanation is she had come into my house at night while I was sleeping, and she left it on the stairs. Who knows what else she touched or did while inside of my house while I was asleep. I was very creeped out. I'm not going to confront her about coming into my house, but I will be avoiding her like the plague. I am moving into an apartment and will soon be rid of her. I am never leaving a door unlocked again. A few years ago, my boyfriend and best friend of four years had just dumped me. A few years ago, my boyfriend and best friend of four years had just dumped me. I was using this website, Meet Me, to meet people in my area while I was in college. My profile clearly stated that I was not explicitly looking for anyone to date. Just wanted to meet new people. I'd just been dumped so I really wasn't trying to put myself out there, and I'm not really the type to go out. In my area. There is a giant dance-a-thon that my university did every year to raise money for the children's hospital. I had someone message me and ask me if I had heard of it. I told him my dance team usually performed at it every year. He told me that he was actually one of the children that was supported by the event when he was younger. I thought that was really cool, so I asked him a little about his experience with that, and genuinely thought it was interesting. After a while, that conversation was kind of dead, and I didn't really have much else to say. Plus, it was getting late and I kind of wanted to go to bed. I told him so, and after about 10 minutes of laying in my bed trying to go to sleep, I got another notification. I glanced at it real fast, and this dude had honestly sent me a novel. After this event, I swiftly deleted the account, so unfortunately I didn't have access to the exact messages so I'm trying to do my best to remember. The first one went a little something like, Look, I'll be honest. I really want to keep talking to you. In fact, I naturally really would like to take you on a date sometime. You seem like a really nice girl and very sweet and interesting. I think we could get along extremely well. I am kind of alone in this world. Insert long-winded commentary about his loneliness here. He also did not use any punctuations, so it took me a long time to dissect this. I responded and told him I wasn't interested. He was about seven years older than me, I was about 20 at the time, and tried to say goodnight again. Then he responded with another novel, along the lines of, I don't think you understand. You are perfect for me. You were made for me, I'm sure of it. God speaks to me, you know. God wants us to be together, and we will be. One day, you will be mine. I'm trying to be polite because he was so nice earlier and I guess I'm naive? I don't really know. But I kept responding, trying to let him down easy. So here are some more highlights. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but God has decided this. Who are we to deny him of his plan? Someday in the future, we will end up together you will realize it soon. We're going to have three children. I know their names. Two boys and one girl. God spoke their names to me. I wrote them down when I was seven years old, and I still have the paper. Do you know how I know that you're going to be my wife? Because I wrote your name down with it. You will be my wife. Don't make a mistake. God is talking to me now. He's saying your name to me. I can't let you leave. At that point, I blocked and reported him, noped the hell out of this site, and went to bed all creeped out. Morning came and he found me on Facebook, and it was going on and on and on, starting with comments along the lines of, Where did you go? How could you do this to me? You're denying your fate. He did it all night. I freaked out told him to leave me alone pretty aggressively and blocked him. I deleted all of my social media apps off my phone for the next few days. 
I asked my roommates to stay at home with me. They agreed after I told them what happened. I was actually genuinely afraid this dude was going to come find me. I mean, he was local, and I had made nice conversation by telling him my major at some clubs I was in. He could have showed up anywhere, but thankfully he didn't, and that was the end of that. It's crazy that we've actually reached 25k. Actually, we've reached 27, so fuck it. Here's a couple more stories, guys. Thanks for 27k. I was 20 at the time and ran a register at a very large super center. So large that we had four registers out in the garden section where I worked at the time. The fresh air and natural light made it far preferable to being inside. The customers were usually pretty friendly if you were polite. This is about one such customer, a friendly 30-year-old woman with a cart full of groceries. We made pleasant small talk and told each other a few jokes, places to eat, bad drivers we'd see, basic shit. The lady behind her joined in and we had a nice, if nondescript, time. Then I scanned her last item and handed her her receipt. She let go of her cart, dropped her smile, and looked me deathly serious in the eyes and said, Remember, if you're ever in a place you don't want to be, draw a circle on the ground and step out of it, and you'll wake up some time else. And then she left. It was half warning have common sense to her, like she was in the Truman Show where they say, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I'd like to add that I asked the other lady if she heard that too, to which she responded with a concern. She didn't say anything, which meant that there were zero witnesses to what she said. I asked a bunch of my friends, family, and co-workers if they'd ever heard something like that. Dead end whatever. The Google search or three later, and the closest thing I could find was an old Jewish belief about magic circles protecting you from demons. In that case though, stepping out would be, you know, suicidal. The part that creeped me out more than anything else was how sharp of a turn it was. This woman went from being the ideal neighbor to straight up mad hatter on a dime. I don't know if you all find this creepy or not, but I've been kept up at night, wondering just what the fuck that was all about, and why the other lady didn't notice. It was a late August night. At the time, I was 17. My best friend and I ran cross-country so we would go for runs around our small suburban town at night. We lived across the town, so we would run to the track. The track is closed off from the town, basically like a college campus atmosphere. It's also right next to the swamps. That night, we had agreed on running to the bleachers to prepare for the season. We took a break from our run to the track to sit and talk. Normal high school girl conversation. We're sitting on the bleachers and we hear leaves crinkling right below us. We immediately stopped talking at the same time. Something didn't seem right. We took note of it as we stared at each other and felt weird, but we decided to stop our break and start running the bleachers. I'm a paranoid person as I read all the stories on Reddit, and I also listen to Crime Junkie and other true crime podcasts. As we're running up and down, I'm looking down in between the bleachers. On our second time going up, I see a white-haired man standing under the bleachers, looking right at me. I immediately told my best friend to run, and we ran as fast as we could, out of the gates and back to the street. That was the last time we went running late at night on the track. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the extra few stories. 
So thanks to everyone for getting us to 27k, and we're just about to hit 28 as well. All the support and positivity is just crazy. I want to thank you all for being a part of the channel and helping it grow. So thanks for everything, guys. This is more than I could have imagined. If you fancy checking out my Patreon, channel memberships, or social media, all my links are in the description below. And as usual, I want to thank my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to B Nick, Lil Smart, Do It, K, Something Edgy, Pretty Girl 215, Borderline Betty, Sarah C, Blazed Goddess, Christopher, Spider's Web, Ula La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Absinthe Alice, Rochelle, Astara Ray, Monique, Crafty Kel, Monica Level 8, Emma, Sean Gorman, Jennifer L, Skittles MM, Gabrielle, Serafina Nightingale, Jennifer C, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I hope you guys enjoyed that and are doing well. And on that note, I'll see you guys on the next one.